perfect opportunity uh, to get political, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to get political. As a matter of fact, I'm going to do everything I can to reject all of the things that are designed to distract us and to focus on the only thing that will protect us, and that is His ever-living Word. Today's message is entitled, The Real Pandemic, A Church with Little Faith. The real pandemic is a church with little faith. Amen. I don't want us to be a part of that church, do you? And we don't have to be as individuals, as families, as a collective body. We don't have to be a part of a weak, faithless body of believers. Are you listening to me? Let's, let's be serious now. This is the only thing that makes any difference to our Father is that we know Him, that we honor Him, and that we do everything that He directs us to do to bring attention to He and His Son and what they have for mankind. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Long statement here. The overrated, overstated, demonic distraction hasn't exposed a weakness in pandemic preparedness, but rather a weak church that doesn't actually believe the Word of God. Now, if that offends you, then you're in the right place. (laughs) If you're watching online and that offends you, huh? you tuned in at the right time. Glory to God. Hallelujah again. It's about a weak church that doesn't actually believe the Word of God. Man, I want to challenge us. I want to challenge us this morning. And be sure you understand, I wouldn't be challenging you if he doesn't challenge me. And honestly, the more he challenges me, uh, the further we can go. Not only in our personal relationship with him, but in actually uh, being a part of what he wants done in our life. Amen? Hallelujah. I do. I believe, I believe my best days are ahead. Glory to God. I know one thing for sure. My loudest days are ahead. My loudest days are ahead. And now that, that, that doesn't necessarily mean just because you're loud doesn't mean it's a good day. But I'll tell you what, I believe I'm going to put them together. I believe I, I'm going to be loud and he's going to be, he's going to be excited to use my loudness. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So again, let me read the statement again. I like this statement. This overrated Say, it's overrated. Overrated. It's overstated. Overstated. Say, it's a demonic distraction distraction. that really wasn't designed designed to expose expose a pandemic pandemic. lack of preparedness. preparedness. But it is showing, it is is revealing revealing. a a weak church, which I am not a part of. But there is one, a weak church that is weak because it doesn't believe the Word of God. What and how much you believe is on you. What you believe and how much you believe is on you. You know, we've talked about this for years. What do you want out of what he's done for you? honestly. And if you don't want much, don't be a hater toward those that want more. Because he said that he came to give us life, but not just to give us life, but to give us that life more abundantly. I'll tell you, you know, uh, you know I have to tell off on myself some, but I'm going to tell you, I want him to stretch me. I want him to stretch me like I've never been stretched before. And you know, he won't if I don't let him. I've got to allow him to stretch me. I've got to be willing to spend time in his face. I've got to be willing to spend time hearing and looking at that word of God and understanding that he bled out for those promises to be a reality in my life. Glory to God. That's what he did for me. 
He didn't bleed out just so we could gather together inside. He didn't, he didn't bleed out just so we could have services two or three times a week and, and have great meetings. and do. No, he did it so you and I could realize and experience the very promises that Jesus paid for. Those promises, the Bible says, are precious. And you know why they're precious? Because he paid for them. He paid for them. And I'll tell you what, I don't think it's very honoring or respectful for us not to want to experience those promises. Who do we think we are that we don't want what our Father has available for us? Glory to God. Now, we're going to look at uh, a little story in the book of Matthew. Uh, They had just finished uh, uh, feeding, the Bible says, 5,000 men plus women and children, probably about 20,000 people were fed, and uh, uh, Jesus was, uh, he was, uh, he was looking forward to taking a little, uh, a little time before the Father, and so uh, uh, he had the disciples go ahead and get in the boat and sent them to the other side, and he re- released all the people that they'd fed, and, uh, and he went up in, uh, uh, in the mountain to pray, and uh, the Bible says that uh, I believe it was in the uh, fourth watch of the night, which is in the morning sometime, earlier than most of us get up. Uh, the Bible says that he came walking on the water, which is, you know, uh, you would say, well, that's no big deal. That was Jesus. He, he could do whatever, you know. Well, I, I'm sure, since we know enough of the, of, the, of the gospel, we know that the Father told him uh, not to rent a boat and catch up. He said, why don't you just walk out there to him? Because didn't he say, I don't ever do anything or say anything? Unless I see or hear the Father say it or show me. Hallelujah. So the, so the Father directed him, why don't you walk on out there? He said, I'm going to show you something. And so he walked out there. We begin in Matthew 14, verse, uh, verse 20, 27. Uh, but straightway Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. So they had cried out for fear. They'd screamed, it's a ghost. Well, you know, we would have probably done that same thing. So really, it's time that none of us look at these people that uh, were there in real time huh? as if they had going for them what we have going for us. We're the ones that should not be startled. We're the ones that should never be fearful because we have the whole word to take a look at and people to glean from and to experience how things are supposed to be. But again, he spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. Be not afraid is not multiple choice. It's not multiple choice. If he said, be not afraid, then he is not expecting us to having having just a tinge of apprehension or concern let alone fear. It's not multiple choice. It's not don't be afraid as long as there's conventional wisdom that you can hang on to. No, we hang on to his word. He said, be not afraid. In verse 28 and 29, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, uh, if it be, if it be you, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. You know, this is one of the series of verses that I really, I really like it and like to explain it a little bit more in King James and in some of the others because some of the words are just so, uh, uh, they just seem so real. And he said, this is what I like about him, Jesus was a man of few words. Amen? I will get better at that in the name of Jesus. Amen. I don't know what you're laughing at. Many of you need to get better at that also. Amen? Now, I know, listen, the family, we're, we're doing, we're, it's, much, it's a much different dynamic in our family than it's ever been. Now, it's never been, it's never been horrible, but it's never been better than it is right now. But listen, it's really strange when you go hours and you pass one another and you never say anything. And I'm thinking, wow, sure is quiet in here. And then I'm thinking, you know, maybe there's something I should say. But you know what? I found out that a real peace comes in a place huh? where you just keep focused on his face. 
just allow yourself to begin to hear from him before you start some small chatter, some small talk. Amen. Doesn't the Bible tell us, and, and I know this doesn't sound like a multitude, but the Bible says that in a multitude of words, uh, there's a great chance that sin is going to show up. Right. Hmm? Anytime we talk a lot, we are making space for things right. to be said that honestly, and honestly, we know ourselves after we've said them, we're thinking, yeah. that was dumb. Right. Huh? Honestly. I mean, we just say stuff, and oftentimes we, we, we believe we're saying it for the right reason, but then when we're done, we say, oh, my God, that was worthless. Huh? Or it's something that you have to repent for. Huh? Amen. We begin to watch. And so Jesus said, come. Hmm? He didn't say, watch that first step. Now, it's going to feel really, you know, it's going to, you know, your ankle, you know, you don't, I mean, you want to just come. Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing? The world, the world has an outline and a program and a how-to book, 360 pages long. Jesus said, come. You know, I don't need to give you any information. Already between your ears, you're thinking about this, but I'm just telling you, come, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Hallelujah. He walked on the water. I, I, I really like hearing um, uh, Brother Hagen uh, teach on this. He teaches on this a lot when he's talking about uh, uh, doubt and fear. And uh, 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 he, he said to people, he said, now listen, if you've never walked on water, he said, I want you to be, I want you to be sure to not be making fun of Peter. Because he walked on the water. I mean, honestly, if he just stepped out and stood there, huh? that'd be a huge deal as opposed to what happens when we step off into a pool. huh? We normally, like a brick, huh? go right to the bottom. But he walked on the water. Peter walked on the water. Well, you know what Peter walked on was the word of God. That's what he walked on. You see, there's no reason for you and I to go out to Green Meadows this afternoon and do any water walking practice. We've got to come to the point that we know we can do what we're told to do if he's the one that tells us to do it. I can remember early on in, in, in our walk with God, PK and I, and uh, my dad, my dad was pretty sarcastic about, uh, uh, about the things of God and the, uh, uh, the plan of God and what God had done for us. And if we talk about healing and, and the different things that we, we see in the word of God, and even as far as, uh, as the dead being raised. And, uh, uh, you know, he would say things like, well, if you believe that, why don't you just, uh, why don't you just go out to the, the funeral home? And I said, you know, why would you, why would you talk like that? about the Father and about his word. But don't you know that uh, I'd probably be concerned on the inside if he told me to do that, but you know, I'd want to know that he told me to do it if I was going to go out there and do it. And so sometimes we blow things off that are available, but you know what? They're not available to everybody. They're not available to everybody. They're only available to people who are available, who are available. No, I would have been the last thing I'd do. Was it it Wigglesworth that uh, that kept standing the guy up? I think it was Wigglesworth. He went to, this guy was dead as a hammer, you know, And and he picked him up and hit him and slapped him against the wall, and the guy fell right down the wall. He's dead, graveyard dead. He's just not in the graveyard. Smith picked him up two or three times, and the guy came back to life. Well, listen, Smith didn't do that. Smith didn't do that. He did what God told him to do. And because he did what God told him to do, God did what he said he'd do. 
just like Peter was able to walk on the water because Jesus said, come. Jesus, if Jesus had laughed and said, Peter, you got to be kidding. Jacked up as you are, you better stay in the boat. I'll be there in a minute. <laughs> no, he said, come. And that's exactly what he was able to do. When Jesus says, come, you can if you believe. If you believe. That's why we want to we wanna set our sights on being supernatural, believing believers. Supernatural, believing believers. He said, come, and you can if you believe. Believing Jesus means rejecting all alternatives. Now the fun begins. Now the fun begins. Now the fun begins. Now I've got some things that came up in my heart uh, this morning, and I'm going to get all this to you in the name of Jesus. So you have to do something if you're going to be a believing believer. You're going to have to reject a lot of things. You're going to have to reject a lot of things. The first thing you're going to have to reject is your, uh, is your propensity or your, uh, your natural inclination to reason and to try and figure things out. The world's answers are an affront to God. I'm telling you like no other time that any of us have ever lived in, this is the time that if we're going to take advantage of what belongs to us, then we must reject the wisdom, the reason that the world has concerning any area of our life, any area of our life. If we're young and we haven't yet made a decision or haven't heard from God as far as what we're to do, as far as furthering our education, if we're in a single situation, if we have not heard from God and know that we know that we know, if we don't hear from him, we are in a season where we better not embrace huh, what is right from a public opinion standpoint. This is the very time that we need to be sure. Because listen, when the Bible says that the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. Huh? It's foolishness to God. Okay, well listen, do you think if the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God, it should be something that we embrace? Why would we embrace what God says is foolish? Why would we do that? So that we fit in with this big group that we're running with? Hmm? Because there must be there must be something that happens. We, we must become intimidated into doing things. I mean, if we know that. The world's wisdom is foolishness. It's foolishness to God. And anything that contradicts what God's word says, but man has put to work in their life, is a lie. And we should not be embracing what the world says if we expect to have what the word says. Conventional wisdom would have kept him in the boat. Conventional wisdom, if he hadn't been Peter and we didn't know how he was, conventional wisdom would have kept his mouth shut. But Peter had an issue with that. But then there was a day called the day of Pentecost. You know, I think about those, and you ought to think about them also. Those men and women that were in the upper room, those others that had a real collision with the Lord Jesus, as we read about them in the New Testament, a real collision, their lives were changed. Peter was no, no longer like he was. I mean, he was bold and confident, but he was bold and confident now uh, in a way that uh, uh, wasn't going to cause him difficulty, but put him in a position where he could be more influential, glory to God. Because I'm going to tell you what, he was persuaded. And that's what happened to the men and women that went through that Pentecostal experience. They got filled with the Holy Ghost and obviously some fire because they continued to grow and become more intense 
in their faith to the point of their willingness to die, to die for what they believe. There's got to be something big about yeah. that where you're so excited about this relationship with him. You don't know exactly where it's going to lead you, but you know it's him that's leading you. So it doesn't make any difference to you. Hallelujah. And they were willing to die. The Bible says that they, uh, they, they didn't love their life even unto death. That's a big deal, isn't it? Huh? I mean, that's a big deal, and that's what a believing believer does. A believing believer is not concerned about their time here, their longevity here. What they're concerned about is the mission that they've been given Why? while they're here. So we go to verse 30, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. Now, you know, I'm, you know that was a two or three steps too late as far as I'm concerned, you know. I mean, I don't think I'd have had a fear issue just hearing him say, uh, bid me come. You know, if I was one of the other guys standing there, none of the rest of them said anything. They're probably thinking, Peter, you are a dumb. <laughs> Peter, we're not sure about you. I mean, we weren't sure, but now we are sure. <laughs> huh? He was afraid and beginning to sink. Uh, he had enough sense, though, to cry out, didn't he? He cried saying, Lord, save me. Where you look is where you'll end up. He looked at the wind. Actually, he looked at what the wind was doing. The wind was actually bringing those waves all up around him. And so he was afraid and he called out. And verse 31, we read, immediately, immediately. This King James, I like this, immediately. Yes. You know, because if you start sinking, you know, that's not a, that's not a slow motion process. You know what I'm saying? As soon as he got afraid, I mean, I'm thinking he thought real quick to be able to get it out before he, it was over his head. You know what I'm saying? Huh? I mean, he cried, save me, huh? And I'm thinking he had to be at least to hear, huh? But Jesus reached out immediately. Now, I want you to pay attention to that. Here's a, here's a guy that was not born again. Hmm? Here's a guy that had not had an opportunity to take advantage of the blood of Jesus. But what was he able to do? He was able to humbly cry out for a Savior. And what did he get? He got saved. He got saved, glory to God. He got delivered from being drowned. Amen. Any of you ever have, have dreams as a child that you were drowning? Any besides, anybody besides me? Thank you. Come on. Help me out a little bit. Have you ever? Those are weird, aren't they? I, now, I don't know if they're designed to keep you out of pools or <laughs> lakes or what those things are designed for. But, you know, uh, I, I tell you what they always, uh, what they always showed me. Uh, that's a miserable way to go. That's a miserable way to go. Of course, any way to go would be miserable if uh, he wasn't in it with you. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Hallelujah. So again, he immediately stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, you know, this is the one thing I'm going to save you, but listen here. O oh, you of little faith, wherefore did you doubt? Little faith. I'm thinking stepping out is humongous faith. Just stepping out of the boat, I'm thinking, this guy, this guy's one in a bunch right here, you know, to step out. What did Jesus say? Oh, you of little faith, wherefore did you doubt? Isn't it amazing that even if you start walking with him or walking to him, there can still be a time when you don't pay attention to him and you will begin to sink sure enough. So this is not, I've arrived. No, this is, I'm just on the journey. But if I don't stay focused, what I look at is going to end up where I am. And as he began to look at the wind boisterous, he began to sink. Jesus didn't, didn't address how conventional wisdom would mock walking on water, but little faith 
and doubt. He didn't say to him, well, Peter, you know, I thought you had better sense than that. I'm Jesus. I can't believe it. Peter, have you ever seen anybody walk on water? How in the world could you ever think that would work? So it wasn't about, it wasn't about uh, conventional wisdom. Conventional wisdom would say you step out of the boat, you're fitting to sink. Simple as that. Hmm? You could talk to uh, a thousand people, and I'll guarantee you all thousand of them are going to say, well, you're going to sink. They're not going to give you a chance to do anything else. But he said, little faith and doubt was exactly what he addressed. Little faith. Little faith. Little faith defined small, lack of trust or intensity, and conviction. You know, you have to be intense about your relationship with God. It has to, it has to really, uh, it has to command um, a really, 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 really great portion of your attention. Um, a great portion of your attention. It has to come to the point where you're the very best at what you do secularly, but at the same time, you're in tune with what he has to say to you spiritually as far as directing you and assisting you in the things that you do. The word doubt is to waver, to be uncertain. Well, I'd have been uncertain before I stepped out. You know, if you're going to be uncertain, that's when you don't do it, huh? No, he said to waver, to be uncertain, unsure, to be hesitant, to be confused, to be skeptical, or the bottom line, unbelieving. You got to get the doubt out. And the only way you can get the doubt out is put the word in. Stand on it. Practice it. Start where you are. Do the things you know to do with the word of God that you've been given. Make it real to you. Quit thinking somebody's got magic dust for you. The only one that's got anything for you is him. Hallelujah. Focusing on, discussing, prioritizing and considering the storm assures defeat. Right. Isn't that what we see in the world around us right now? Yeah. We're discussing, we're prioritizing, yeah. we're determining. I believe this will reduce the chance by this many percentage points. I believe this, I believe this, I believe this. I ain't got time to believe all that. Right. I ain't got time to believe all that. Right. And then the problem is you change channels. And they got a different set of rules. Huh? How are you going to believe? I mean, the first liar don't stand a chance. I mean, they lie on every channel. Hallelujah. The only one that never changes is our Father. The Word of God is the same. Huh? It's always the same. And, he, and, he, and he, there's no what ifs or buts with His Word. Glory to God. Huh? So focusing on, focusing to fill in there. On discussing prior towards and considering the storm assures defeat. Huh? You know, it's just like, it's just like we're, told, we're, we're told to speak to the mountain, not talk about the mountain. Because have if, if you ever had something really in your life and, and, uh, and you begin to talk about it and the son of a gun gets bigger? Have you ever started talking, talking, talking about your mountain and all of, uh, all of, all of a sudden your, your mountain becomes a range? A mountain range, huh? It's not just a mountain because you're, you're, you're talking about it. And, and you got other people's opinion about their mountain. And sure enough, they'll say, dang, that's a big mountain. I don't know how you're ever going to overcome. That is a whoo. I don't know of anybody that's ever been able to defeat a situation like that. No, we speak to our mountain. We give our mountain orders. We don't allow our mountain to order our conversation or our situation. Knowing the wind speed, oh, this is good. Knowing the wind speed, the dead amount, the prognosis, the wave height, or any of the other non essential <laughs> issues only serve to cripple 
your faith. Those are all non-essentials for us. I just had a warm fuzzy. <laughs> Dang, maybe my coat's just too tight. I just had a, just had a warm fuzzy, huh? All of that stuff, it's non-essential. Man, you talk to people, oh, you don't want to talk to people today. This is no day to talk to people that don't know in whom they have believed. And listen, not everybody that's a believer is a believing believer. As a matter of fact, most believers are unbelieving believers. And they want to hear what you think about this. Now, watch it now. I'm not going to get political. Huh? They're going to want, well, what do you think about How far do you think we ought to be apart? I I think I need to be a long way from you. I I need to be a long way from you because I don't want to listen to that smack. Okay? Huh? I like what Pastor Greg said the other day. Hallelujah. I like what Pastor Greg said the other day about, he, he, he talked about people. Now listen, don't get upset now. I, I mean, if you've got a mask in the car, that's up to you, okay? <laughs> huh? But listen, Pastor Greg said to me, he said, you know, I just want to tell somebody's got to, if, if, if that's all you've got, if that's all you've got is a mask, huh? I mean, we have enough issues trying to, trying to get our masks off. So we can make ourselves vulnerable to the word of God. Let alone now we're putting a mask on huh, to protect us from, I ain't never figured it out yet. But I'm done with all that. You know what I'm saying? But like I said, you know, if that's all you've got is a mask, huh? And man, they're selling them. They're selling those. I mean, this would be the time that a Christian should have opened a mask company. Because there are people buying them masks, huh? And I don't know how long they last. They say you can wash them, but how do they know? Lord Jesus, how do they know, huh? How do they even know how you get it unless you got it? And I'm going to tell you what, they ain't testing me. They not testing me. They ain't testing me. You know what? Let me just tell you right now, since I'm not getting political, I don't trust them. I don't trust them. You know, and I'm in that vulnerable age group. That's what they say. I'm in that vulnerable age group. I understand that the average age of those that are dying is like 81. Now, I'm not quite that yet, but hey, you know, I can see it from here. (laughs) But you know what Jesus said? Be it unto me according to my faith. Not to the quality of mask or the gloves or the separation. Be it unto me according to my faith. You take your plans and you put them, you put them right there, right there where there's no sun. That's all I got to say about that. Now, I don't know who, I don't know who caused that to happen, but... If you'll fess up to it between services, I'll be, able, I'll be able to apologize to everybody on your behalf. Be wise. A good report from the world will soon be slapped down by a bad one. Hmm? Only God's word is always the good news. It's always the good news. Always the good news. Let me tell you a couple of things that, uh, no, I'm not. Romans 10.10. For the heart of man, for with the heart of man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation with the heart of man. This is probably my 27th definition of heart <laughs> that I'm going to give you right now. Well, listen, my revelation is progressive. I mean, I mean it doesn't get worse or weird. It just, it's just progressive. I, and, and the revelation and the definitions he gives, gives me, he gives them to me because he wants me to understand. Yeah. And if I don't understand what I'm saying, how in the world can I expect you to understand what I'm saying? So I want to make it as simple as Simple as possible. Heart. 
the hidden man of the heart is where the compilation, now don't you know that's a great word, where the compilation of thoughts, beliefs, passions, desires, and appetites, and affections find their launching pad. Your heart. Now, if everything, if everything came from your recreated spirit, we'd all be meeting out on green meadows, standing around, making a big show for all the people out there fishing. Hmm? But the truth is, the issues of life flow out of our heart. And our heart is the place where all of the things that we've just seen here, our thoughts, our beliefs, our passions, our desires, our appetites and affections. That's where they're launched from. Your heart determines if you live or die. Your heart determines that. Your heart determines that. Your heart. Not somebody else's. Your heart. Not somebody else's prognosis or diagnosis. Your heart. Mark eleven twenty two, Jesus said, have faith in God. Yes, have faith in God. You know, there are a few verses you could just remember, and that would be one of them. When you hear all of these, all of these alternatives and all of these things that can transpire, man, that's the time you turn away from that. Yes, you right. reject that. Right. You say, no, I, I'm, I'm going to have faith in God. What, right. what does God have for me? Because I'll tell you, I don't care how close you are to sinking, huh? if you can get it out of your mouth in humility, you're going to be saved, glory to God. Amen? When we face something that's not allowed in heaven, it's the word, not charm and compromise, that will set us and keep us free. Listen, listen, we got to get the compromise where it belongs, under our feet. We don't need to just fudge a little bit by trying to figure a little bit. We need to maintain our faith in him. Charm, charisma, certainly not compromise, will protect us and keep us. See, whatever's not authorized in heaven, that's not authorized in your life. It's not authorized in your life. Jesus bled out for you to not have to deal with stuff that don't go on in heaven. If it don't go on in heaven, it doesn't need to go on in your and my life. Glory to God. That means we got to turn our back. We got to turn a deaf ear to certainly fear or any information that creates anticipation or anxiousness in our life. What did he say in Matthew 16 to, to Peter? He said, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth, and what you bind on earth is predicated. Your ability to bind on earth. What needs to be bound is predicated on the fact that it's already bound from heaven. If there's none of it in heaven, huh? You're a carrier of heaven. The dead gum kingdom is within you. You're a carrier of what Jesus paid for. But it's only going to be the believing believers that approach this in such a way that they they actually embrace it, glory to God. Because I'm going to tell you... (coughs) Narrow. Yeah. Yeah, come on. Narrow is this place. And few is the number to find this believing believer's yeah. life. So, are you persuaded that you want more of this life? I'm not, and I don't believe you are either. Hallelujah. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth that's already loosed in heaven 
It'll be loosed into your life. <clears throat> It'll be loosed into your life. But you've got to bind the bad and loose the good. And you've got to do it in the face of adversaries, haters, bullies, relatives. If you expect to have what it takes to take a hold of that. Let me show you a couple of things. We've got a few minutes here that came up in my heart this morning. I thought it was interesting. I didn't know we were showing the, the Billy Graham uh, clip, but I like that a bunch. It makes me cry. It makes me cry. What a man of God, you know? In my times of meditation, talking about me, the Father is always endeavoring to take me where I haven't been. To take me where I haven't been. Because I haven't been everywhere. I don't have everything experientially. So he's trying to take me there. Wanting more is always predicated on you or me recognizing the Father's pull so on your heart. Yeah. Now, if you don't sit down and take time, if you're not quiet long enough, hmm, you know, if it's taken extra time to open your bag of masks, then maybe you might not have time to do this. But it's all predicated on that pull on your heart. Now, let me tell you something. You don't make that pull. You don't create that pull. But you create that opportunity. You create that opportunity. See, you'd never convince me that God, God doesn't have his goodness pulling on all the time. He's pulling on people. Amen. Sure. Romans 2, 4 says, or despise the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God is what leads you to repentance. Right. Right. Now we know one of the definitions for repentance is obviously uh, uh, changing the way you think, uh, uh, developing a, an, an abhorrence or a hatred yeah. for the sin that you once lived in. But there was, there was some more definition here. I mean, I didn't, I didn't pull this out of the air. This is, more, this is more definition, legitimate Strong's definition. To change one's mind. He's always wanting us to change the way we think about him. He's always wanting us to realize that there's more. Because there's always more. I don't want everyone to be satisfied. To change one's mind for the purpose of knowing something he's done. Hallelujah. Because he he done it for you. Yes, amen. He done it for you. But you gotta find out what it is. The Father never talks about plan B to me, but plan A. Yes, now listen, I've done some things. I've done some things in life. I'm not talking about sinful things. I mean, but they, they didn't bring honor to God, which doesn't make him very practical either, does it? That doesn't right. so it's hard to get out of this conversation. <laughs> I'm at the point in my life right now when, when, uh, when I'm not able to uh, believe and receive what's mine, it bugs me. It bugs me. Actually, it irrigates me. I can say irrigates me instead of saying something else. It would be offensive to the people that are watching, but not to those sitting here listening. In other words, in other words, I want to know, Father, what, what, where, where am I missing it? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Where am I missing it? What, am, 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 am I not serious enough? You know, some of those, you don't even have to have him answer. Right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you can just, right. uh, you can just kind of see him nodding. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. <laughs> that's right. And so, you know, it's for everybody. But I'm excited that we all get presented that opportunity. The Father never talks about plan B to me, but plan A. And this is, this is a point of contention now with, with unbelieving believers, isn't it? It's a big deal. If you're an unbelieving believer, you want B through Z. 
This is what he told me this morning. I just typed this out this morning. You're blessed. When all we hear is plan B, we will never walk in plan A. And that is religion. That's religion. Hmm? I put some asterisks beside this. Religion always makes excuses and provides alternatives for our not being able to receive and walk in what the word clearly says Jesus paid for. But I'll tell you, conventional, conventional wisdom. Yeah. Hmm? Everybody say, well, you know, I know, but, uh, yeah. oh, listen, don't get, me, don't get me over there. That's worse. If I get over there, that's worse than politics. Right. If he put your sickness and disease on Jesus, what would that say to Jesus if he had another plan for you? Listen, I don't want to fudge on this because somebody might get it. And one of them might be me. I mean, I've been blessed and fortunate over the years, honestly. I've been blessed and fortunate. I believe confession and trust has kept me in the condition I'm in and in the position I'm in. And I would give no no, uh, accolades to diet or anything else you got to have faith in God and faith in God is plan A that's plan A huh? we've been lied to huh? for centuries for centuries we've been lied to and we've been lied to by people that we have confidence in people who had spiritual positions in our lives that spoke about plan B, and it's okay. It's all right. Well, I don't know that it's okay with God to not do your very best, to present yourself holy and acceptable unto him, to give him the opportunity to do something for you that no man can do. I think that's what he wants from us. Now, if we're too comfortable... If our lifestyle is already too easy and too set and fixed to do things differently, then we ought to look for some more discomfort then maybe. huh? Because he's always expected us to come and to receive when he says that it's available. If only faith pleases God. Isn't that what Hebrews 11, 6 says? Doesn't it say without faith? It is impossible to please God. Impossible. No chance. For those that come to God must believe that he is, that he is God, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That means without faith, we can't please God. Doesn't say without faith he doesn't love us. It says we can't please him. Because he set up this faith connection in order for us to get these supernatural results. If only faith pleases God, do you think your eye selecting alternatives is pleasing? Hey, this was personal to me. This was personal to me. I don't want any alternatives. I don't want any alternatives. He's given me the keys. Hmm? You know, if he's coming back for this bride that the word says he's coming back for, I believe there's going to be a lot of people that are a lot different than they were before this time. I believe there are going to be a lot of men and women of God who are not going to be satisfied, are not going to just lean on the alternatives. We're not going to compromise what the Word of God says. But I'm telling you, you have to start right now. And you have to start where you are. Now, He's not going to meet you there. He's already told you what belongs to you. He's not going to meet Listen, let me tell you something. He's not going to meet you in the emergency room. 
I said, he's not going to meet you in the morning. And today, man, today that'd be the last, that'd be the last place I'd want to be. And thank God for all those that work and do all of that. But the bottom line is he don't meet you there. I said, he don't meet you there. If he did everything that needed to be done and put it on Jesus, then don't tell me that he meets you through the hands of man when he's already bled out through his son. And to honor him is to believe in what he did. So what we do is we start right where we are. See, you got to start where you are because that sounds like a big deal right now because we got us a family doctor or we got us a whatever or we got us a, 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 a pill regimen or whatever we've got going. I'm just telling you so we'll all know. So we'll all know. I, I don't believe that it pleases God that we use alternatives. Now, I'm not talking about some weird stuff. We're all welcome here. We're all growing. I'm just telling you. How could you please God and not believe God? How could, you, how could you please him if you don't believe him? Huh? Well, he's just so full of love. and Well, he sure is. But his word doesn't change. His word doesn't change. He sent his word. I said he sent his word. And healed them. And delivered them from their destruction. Sent his word. He didn't send religion. He didn't send some watered down, hmm? charismatic, huh? Seven divinity degrees. Just give me the divinity. That's fudge, isn't it? No. He sent his word. He sent his word. You know why he sent his word and didn't send something else? Because he wanted to send the very pure heart that he had so that no one else would have to interfere or could interfere with what's available to us. We can each take it. That's why what I say while I go, what Jesus says so many times, be it unto you according to your faith. And in the name of Jesus, don't allow that to become intimidating. Don't begin to beat yourself up because of where you are, but thank God you don't have to stay there, That's right. huh? That's that right. your last days can be your best days, right. that your last days can be the days you spend the least amount on alternatives, and you're able to grow yes. and to be all he's called you Glory to God. be, huh? Yes. I'm yes. telling you, I wouldn't. Mm. I'm not going to sit and listen to somebody that tells me that I don't have these exceeding precious promises. And I'm not going to sit and listen to somebody that tells me that I need an alternative to walk and to have an abundant life. Because I believe my Father, through my Savior, paid a price that was enough if you were believing His Word according to his plan. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's all bow our heads. Stand your feet if you would.